Uh, so we have uh, Claude DeVita, the CEO of Blog Pause, and she's going to talk about uh, storytelling for fundraising. Um, Chloe is CEO of Blog Pause and a storytelling coach who has helped a local nonprofit grow their fundraising year over year for the 10 years she served on the board. She has seen fundraising success and also knows the burnout and heartbreak that fundraising can cause. As CEO of Blog Pause, she produced pet blogger conferences, bringing together pet brand and pet bloggers to learn about digital marketing. Those events raised over $125,000 in cash for pet shelters and over $50,000 in goods from 2010 to 2018. Chloe counts being one of Pet Age's 40 Under 40, a Muse Medallion winner from the Cat Writers Association and a finalist for Women of the Year in the pet industry in her list of honors. Today, she is here to share what she's learned about storytelling that can specifically help everyone whose job it is to create the fundraiser that supports the organization's mission. Whether your annual budget is $10,000 or $10 million, close storytelling format will help your nonprofit craft better fundraising stories and connect with more donors. Thank you so much, Stacy. Uh, appreciate the intro. I'm really excited to be here and share with everyone and hope you can take away some things that start elevating your storytelling that you're using in your fundraising and giving you a, a simple way to do it because we all know that when it comes to raising money for the pets who we rescue and who we love the most important details in that story is not just the story itself but how you tell it uh, and that's from the words that you choose, the details that you provide, the pictures that support it. All of that can make or break your fundraising story. And let's be honest, the moral of every story when we're talking about fundraising, especially in animal welfare, is more money helps save more lives. That's what we're going for here. More money helps save more lives. And the thing about storytelling it's not as easy as some think because there are elements to it that connect and there are ways to do it that are boring. So I'm gonna help you find uh, a way with your organization to come up with stories that will actually connect with your audience and hopefully grow your donor base because I know that's what we really want. And you know, the truth is as much as we wanna talk about storytelling and believing it's ever easy that's just not true i mean let's be real no one would ever say fundraising has ever been easy that's a no it's getting harder though harder and harder to connect harder to keep people's attention you're no longer just competing with other fundraisers you're now competing for people's attention you're competing with an expanding list of needs that take dollars to have things like cell phones and the internet and Netflix, all of those things didn't used to be a budget item. You know, 20 years ago, those things weren't a part of people's budgets and now they are, which means more and more of their allocated spend that might go towards the, you know, the flex things like donations is probably shrinking. So as fundraising has continuously gotten harder, the attention of everyone else is harder to capture. Now, I want to be real clear on my beliefs around attention because we hear a lot about people not having, <laughs> basically, I, the, the term that came out at some point because of some study that actually wasn't even what the study was about was that people's attention spans were shorter than a goldfish's. <laughs> that's not true and it's not what the, if you actually go do the research online, that's not what the study was about. However, the the sort of underlying piece of that is that it isn't about people's attention spans. We have attention spans. I guarantee you, everybody listening right now, all of our peers, colleagues, children, young people, old people, everyone in between, we have attention spans. We will sit and watch Netflix for hours and hours. We will sit there and scroll through social media for longer than anyone wants to admit. It is not our attention span that's the problem. It's the number of things that we can give our attention to and whether those things feel like they're worth giving it. So basically what you're competing for is the attention somebody has and you need to capture it. 
So it isn't about whether or not they have it, they do. If you can capture somebody's attention, you have them and you should take advantage of that and they will become somebody who is a donor, a loyal, trustworthy advocate, all of those things. But it's that capturing piece that is hard because how do you break through the noise, right? That's what they call it a lot. The noise that's out there, the content that's out there, it's more than just fundraisers. If they are scrolling through their Facebook feed or their Instagram or TikTok, wherever they are, they're looking for the thing that will capture their attention and they're constantly scrolling until they do. So it may be, and I could get behind a study that said it took, you know, a couple, you have a couple of seconds to capture someone's attention. I believe that to be true. So how do you do that, right? How do you break through the noise? How do you capture someone's attention so that you can take advantage of the fact that they do have an attention span? What are, what are the tips there? So here's the thing. People are looking for two things. I've done a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of discussions, done a lot of focus type groups, served and worked with a lot of different boards of nonprofits, been on the board of a nonprofit for 10 years as president. We did a lot of fundraising. That particular one wasn't in the pet space, but it was in an arts filled space uh, and it, it had a similar feel for me. And everything boiled down to two things for what people are looking for and what will capture their attention. And those two things are first, transparency. Okay, people want to know that you aren't hiding behind some cloak, right? They want to know that you're real, that you're out there, um, and there's ways for them to find that now, right? They can do from what they can research online, from Charity Stars, from all the places that they can figure out, is this organization transparent? And the second thing, are they truthful? People want transparency and they want truth. Those things can capture attention. And the thing is, sometimes we as, as organizations worry about sharing too much of the nitty gritty or behind the scenes. For sure, there is a spectrum in there, an area of, you know, how much truth do you have to share? However, think of it as being so clear and so transparent and sharing as much of your truth that everyone feels like if they had a question, you would answer it truthfully. So that's kind of where some of the, the details come in. People don't just want to know your story. They don't just want you to be have transparency and be truthful. They want to feel a part of it. And that's where that gray area starts to exist. Although I would also argue that between black and white, we constantly talk about gray, but that's just the color when black and white overlap. When you have black and white, they're on the ends of a spectrum. And what's in between is an immense amount of colors. So much color that you have a lot of room within how you share things and what you say, as long as they fall under being transparent and being truthful, because that makes people want to be a part of your story, want to feel like they can share your story because they trust it. And that's what both, both of those things lead to. Trust, this is the key. If you lose the trust of your donors, of your audience, if, you, if there's anything that makes people question in too big of a way, meaning they don't trust that they can even get an answer, then you're going to lose them for good. And rebuilding trust is a massive mountain to climb. It's not, it's not what you want to do. You want your stories to lead with transparency and truth so that you're building trust. And people who trust you will come back. They'll donate again. They'll share your story. They'll promote you. They become your advocates and your ambassadors. And you can probably, as you're listening, think of the people who already in your organization fall under this, the people who volunteer their time endlessly, who are always donating, who are always sharing, who are doing whatever it is that they can do to help support your organization. And that has so much to do with the trust that you've built. And the two things that are gonna build that trust are transparency and truth everything will boil down to those two things. Trust is literally the foundation of stories. So we're gonna go into a 
way that you can tell your story. But just keep in, in your mind as you're creating any fundraiser going forward, as you're working on stories, a lot of this can even be applied to what you share in social media, what you put in your newsletters. Where in it is the piece that people are connecting with and building trust? Always think about that. How am I building trust with my audience? Trust is invaluable. Okay, so what are the ingredients? of a trust-filled story. How do we move into a trust-filled story? Well, let's first talk about the three types of stories to tell. These are examples, um, most, I, at least in my experience, most fundraisers fall under one of these three types of stories. And I'm sure there are others that, that you can think of. Everything will still apply. You'll hear me refer to these types of stories the most. So the first one is gonna be that single animal fundraiser. Uh, and in some cases, it is a colony. Let's say you're doing a TNR fundraiser, and that's about a colony. It's still sort of about a, a pet or a group of pets that, you know, think of it as a family. It's, it's a small group or a single animal, and there's a reason, right? Maybe it's they're injured, they have medical needs, the heartworm prevention. TNR is actually a reason. So there's those types of stories where the story is about them. It's about that one animal, it's about that one colony. That's the story, that's the focus. Then the next one, your annual campaign fundraiser. This could be the thing that is on your calendar that comes up every year and you think, oh gosh, it's coming again. What are we gonna talk about this year, right? It could be that annual type of fundraiser. It could also be for Giving Tuesday. That's something that comes up every year. Maybe that is your annual fundraiser. Maybe you use it for that, or maybe it's just another annual thing you participate in. And so you have to think about, okay, what are we doing for Giving Tuesday this year? What's the story we're telling? Um, maybe you do something for, you know, National Shelter Awareness Week. There are a lot of different reasons why there is a date on your calendar every year for a story that comes up that you have to tell. And it's, it's ongoing, right? It's something you have to do every year. The date rolls around and you're like, okay, team, what are we talking about? That's a type of story to tell. And the last story here that we'll talk about is that larger purpose fundraiser. So this could be something like you are fundraising a capital fundraiser for a building or maybe a van. Uh, it could also be a fundraiser you are trying to do just to cover operating costs. And as we know, that is the hardest thing to fundraise for. It, it It's just like everybody wants to help the see that their money is helping the pets. And sometimes it's harder to convince them that they need to help the organization so that the organization can help the pets. <laughs> so that that could be a hard one. But this, this could also be the kind of fundraiser where you're doing it in conjunction with another organization or another company. Like um, recently I saw in Denver, uh, the local cat cafe was having a weekend fundraiser for um, a local cat, actually a TNR company, or not company, organization. And so something like that, right, where it's you're basically leveraging somebody else's audience. And so you still need a story to tell to that audience to hopefully, you know, be able to get some new donors from it. But it isn't so much you being the sole purpose of whatever's going on. And that can happen, too, with with an events where maybe you're the beneficiary, but it's not the reason that people are at the event. So that's the kind of larger purpose type fundraiser. The fundraiser story that goes across all three of these is all of the grants that everyone applies for, because there are grants that fall under each of these. So I will talk a little bit about that, but grants are definitely their own uh, beast. <laughs> and all of the grant writers out there, I honor you <laughs> so much because it is such, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, fundraising in general is a lot of work. Getting all of those stories into a grant form for whatever you're submitting is a lot of work. So I just want to take a moment and honor you all. This work is not for the faint of heart, and I know that it can be heartbreaking at times. But going back to transparency, you want to think about all these stories and the details that you're going to provide to help someone trust you, right? Not meaning maybe not the nitty gritty, all of the nitty gritty, but the things that let them see you're not holding back, right? You don't want someone to feel like there's more to the story. You want them to feel like, wow, I wonder what maybe the other side is, or, you know, they have a question that they feel like they you would answer. That's sort of the invitation of trust is you put out the details and they feel like if there is something, if they do have a question that they can ask it, 
and get an answer. So these are the stories we'll talk about, but let's get into what just makes a great story, the, the basic ingredients. First is the headline. So when we talk, when I talked about capturing attention, headlines are what capture attention. Um, obviously, you do not want them to be clickbaity. This is where you want to be truthful. And it's also the thing that is going to get people to click or get people to stop scrolling, get people to open that email, get people to share. Headlines are a really important thing. And one of the mistakes I sometimes see is that people try to create the headline before creating the story. I recommend creating all your stories. I'll lead you through uh, my, my method in doing so here in just a moment. But create it first and then go back and think, what is the headline in this? What is, what is the, the most compelling piece that's going to capture someone's attention? You want it to be enticing without being misleading, right? So headlines are a really important piece of story. Next is relating. And relating means using something that people are familiar with. So for instance, um, not too long ago, I was helping someone craft a story for a hoarding case and they were hesitant to use the word hoarding. Uh, we, we got through that, but hoarding, just, just me saying hoarding puts pictures in your mind. Right away, you understand that that can be a really severe and unfortunate situation for any pet, much less many pets in that kind of situation, which in hoarding is always many pets. So using finding those words that describe something that immediately let people know what you're talking about are really helpful. Sometimes they're relevant in the headlines, sometimes not, but definitely in the story, you want to think about what is the piece that people will get right away just from a word or a couple of words. This isn't about being overly descriptive. This is just like a hoarding case. When I say that, you have an image. It's quick, it's easy, it's clear. So you wanna think about what, what in your stories, obviously that's a very specific for an animal. You know, in a larger type fundraiser, if you were doing it for a building, um, you know, then you would think about what are, what are the ways that you could share the benefit of what it would be like to have a place for the pets to live, right? Come up with that. It's literally like Airbnb for cats, um, something that relates. And that's an analogy, which is what's great about relating is if you have something that you have an analogy for that helps people right away go, oh, I get it. It's really, really helpful. So think about that. What can you use and say that helps people relate to what you're talking about? Then there's emotions. This is where the descriptors come in. This is where you get people to feel, you make that heart connection, you bring in all the adjectives, you want to give more of a descriptive feeling. However, I will say, focus on clarity over creativity. And what I mean when I say that is, I sometimes see people try to get, they're on thesaurus.com, searching for a new way to say sad a new way to say happy, a new way to say beautiful. You know, the, the basic descriptors that we've all come to know, I see people trying to get more creative with. Maybe there is a place for that sometimes, but in most cases, just using the word that people know is most effective. Just using the simple word that connects the person to the emotion is most effective. So, as you're writing and you're creating your stories, look at your descriptors, look at your adjectives, look how you're describing the emotions and see if it's clear or if you're being a little bit too creative and uh, thesaurus.com is your best friend, <laughs> which I don't discount. I have done that as well and I totally understand. Um, so emotions are very important. The last one here is one that in fundraising, can be a little bit more difficult and I will say is somewhat dependent on ability, um, time capacity, um, all, all the things that as a nonprofit organization 
are part of just the friction of running the organization, right? Having enough people, having enough time. And the closure piece is the piece that for your donors, for the people whose attention that you've captured, it's what they're looking for so that they have closure. It is a little bit less about you, like obviously you need to share at the end so that you have the closure and you're giving it, but it's for them. It's for them so they feel like there was an ending. They feel like they know where their money went and what it did, even if it's bad. Sometimes the end isn't great, but there's still like, knowing the end of the story is important. It's sort of like, I'm sure we've all sat in a movie theater at some point in our lives and gotten to the end of the movie and thought, well, wait, that, that, that's it? But what about, and I don't, and you just are left with all these questions and not really even understanding how the movie ended. <laughs> Maybe it's like a French film. <laughs> but that is what you do not want to leave your audience with. So as you're doing a fundraiser and you're getting to what's closure, it's often meaning needing to update them. You want to give them a where it ended or status updates if it's something that's ongoing. So they feel like they know what's going on. And when they think about how they are a part of it with whatever donation they made, that they can say, here is what it went towards, or here is where they're at, or here's the result. Results are a really important thing for people to feel when it comes to donating. They want to know how much money did you raise? What happened to the 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 animal or the animals? What happened to the building? What happened to the van? What happened at the cat cafe? What happened? They want that ending. So don't discount the idea that you might not be able to provide it at the beginning because when you're fundraising, you might not know the end yet. But to provide that closure, that, that email after uh, maybe a couple status updates, that is the piece that lets people feel like they can put closure on the donation they made and build the trust that allows them to feel connected to you so they can keep donating. And in the end, while we're all trying to grow our donor base, we're also trying to drive up that lifetime value of every donor. And that means getting repeat donations. So keep that in mind. You want a good headline that captures them. You want to capture them in. You want to use content that gets them to relate to what you're talking about and pulls on the emotions, connects them to you so that they feel like they can trust you and then give them that closure so that they know that they can trust you. That's what makes a great story. Those are the ingredients. And I just love this quote by Steven Spielberg. People have forgotten how to tell a story. Stories don't have a middle or end anymore. They usually have a beginning that never stops beginning. That is what we're going to get to here with the format of how to tell a story. Because unfortunately, that is one of the things in storytelling that um, is how you would lose somebody's attention is too much detail on and on and on. It's like the story goes on and on and on. And we've all been there too, where you're like hearing something, you think they're getting to the end and then it just starts a new thing. And you're like, where is this going? It's very hard for people to keep track of things if, if there's just a never ending beginning. <laughs> so we are gonna show you now how to do that. Um, one of the things I would love to know, and you can put in the chat, I can't see the chat right now, but at the end when we get to Q&A, I would love to go back and look at is, do you have a headline for a fundraiser you're working on right now or coming up or some ideas that you've done? And if so, share it in the chat. I'd love to read some headlines that you guys have been using, you all have been using so that I can um, give you a high five or give you some feedback. Please keep in mind that if you share it, I assume that you're allowing and accepting that you would get feedback from me there in the chat. So go ahead and put those in. When we get to Q&A, uh, we can take a look at them. Okay, so let's get to the story spine. This is, story spine is sort of age old. I'll get into exactly what it is and how I've created a different story spine specifically for fundraising because your stories are a little bit different. Their goal is a little bit different, right? You think about a general story, it's to take people on a journey. And while you are doing that, you are always gonna have a journey where at the end you want them to donate. You're looking for them to open up their pockets and give you some money, some something, right? And I'm all for the, I don't care if it's a dollar, five dollars, fifty dollars, five hundred dollars. Obviously, the more that somebody gives, the more you can do with it. But just the fact that you can build a relationship on five dollars, especially if that's something that can be repetitive, is so important in fundraising. And I think we all understand that. 
So the story spine, and I just have to say, I love this photo of the, the cat because as we know, cats spines are flexible. And in a fundraising story spine, there's a little flexibility in that too. Okay, so what is the story spine? It's a, it was created a long, long time ago. Actually, I think if you research it, it's back into the early 80s where it came out as an official um, format for anyone to follow. But it started before then and Disney was one of the first to use it. And if, as we know, Disney is, love them or not, they're great storytellers. There's a reason they have huge amusement parks all over and characters that people love because they're great at storytelling. They're great at getting people to connect with what the story is about. And for them, it's usually about a person or a couple of people. The story spine has just a simple foundation and it's literally about that. It is a spine. It's just here are the specifics and then you build out from there. So if you can see this up here on the screen, you'll see it shows on the left there, beginning, the event, the middle, the climax, the end. And another way to think about that on the right is the little, little uh, sketches where it says introductions, a routine, the routine is broken, there's consequences, the consequences have success or failure, and from that a new routine is created. That's the foundation of a full-on story. And to give you an example of one, um, you'll know what this is pretty quickly, but this is the story spine of a very, very well-known film. And I'm going to use the prompts from the story spine. So the once upon a time, every day, but one day, and because of that, those prompts there, I'm going to use here to show you a story spine of a very famous movie that you will know. Once upon a time, there was a little girl who was carried off by a tornado to a magical land. Every day, she journeyed towards the Emerald City in order to ask the great and powerful wizard to help her get home. But one day, she got there and she met the wizard. And because of that, the wizard told her that he would only help her get home if she killed the Wicked Witch of the West. And because of that, she encountered many dangers and was finally successful in destroying the witch. And because of that, the, wit the wizard agreed to take her home in his hot air balloon. Until finally, on the day of their departure, she ran after her dog and missed the balloon entirely. And ever since then, she learned that she always had the power to get home on her own, which she did. So we all know that story, The Wizard of Oz. And that's obviously a very minimal spine of the whole story. We think to the movie and all the things that happened, but those are that sort of high level points, right? So th this is what the story was built off of. And it's how you can start thinking about your stories, but let's get specifically into what it means for fundraising. So how can you take that and translate it to a story that you can share in your fundraising? So this is the fundraising storytelling story spine. This is something I created based on what I kept seeing, um, the organization I was working for, other organizations around me, people I was helping, specifically around fundraising. And I kept seeing what are the pieces that are being included in the story that are most helpful. Uh, I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest mistakes is that people provide too many details. Right? There's too much in the details. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that here in a moment. But this is something, this fundraising story spine can help you hone in on the important details. So <laughs> these pieces, I'm just going to read them here. Who's involved? What do you know? What you found? What that means? And what that means? And what that means? What you need and why you need it. And the TBC is to be continued because that's where the closure piece that we talked about earlier comes in. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit more. Who's involved? This is really specifically either the animals or the person involved. If it's a fundraiser fully for your organization, then it is, there's a lot more of who's involved, but you don't necessarily need to name them all. You just need to talk about the organization as a whole and how the people in it are supporting it or how the animals are benefiting, depending on what your fundraiser's goal is, like what it's about, right? The fundraiser is about the animals, then that's who's involved. If the fundraiser is about the organization, then it's the people. So thinking just who's involved, who, what are, what are the basics? Who, who do we need to make sure 
we mention in our story. The next one, what do you know? Okay, so in the example of the hoarding case, obviously hoarding, we know was happening. But the other thing is when you arrive on something like that, uh, any kind of case, when you find a new colony of cats, community cats, when something happens to a colony you know about and you show up, you're given information in that moment and you are often making assumptions about how the situation got to the point that it's at. Assumptions can be great to share, but you first wanna say, what do you know? And what you know are the facts in front of you. So you list those. What are the facts in front of you? What are the things in whatever situation you're in that you know? If this is a more broad fundraiser for your organization or in partnership as part of an event, then what you know is where the organization is at. What is the current status of the organization? That's what you know, and that's what you want to share. Next, what you found. This one, remember I mentioned that storytelling, uh, story spine is a bit flexible, like a cat spine. Um, what you found is not always relevant because this is relevant in those situations where you did come upon something and there's an immediate fundraiser, there's an urgency to it. And so what you know is just the facts in front of you, right? When you arrived on scene, what you found is the status. So if what you know is there are somehow 20 new cats in a colony that used to only be 10, or there are 50 new cats in a colony that used to only be 20, what you found is cats under cars and cats here and cats here and cats here and kittens and this and that. Those are the differences between those, but the what you found won't always be relevant uh, because you're not always coming upon something in, in an urgency type manner. But what you know is always relevant. Okay, so you got who's involved, you got what you know, possibly what you found. Now you move on to what that means. So if you don't have what you found, you go right from what you know to what that means. If you do have what you found, then, then you, what that means is literally something you can ask yourself. Okay, so I found all this, what does that mean? Just literally ask yourself that and answer it. And then why it says repeat is because often you need to go deeper into what it means. So your first answer to what it means is going to you know, have some specifics in it. Then read that answer, the answer to what it means, the first answer. And again, ask yourself, so what does that mean? What does the answer to what it means mean? <laughs> Getting very meta here. But that's what allows you to dive in deeper. And you want to do that until you get to the point where you don't really have an answer anymore to what that means. And one of the reasons for that is it's often the place where you find the hidden emotion, the hidden um, relating pieces. So this particular step is a really important one. So whether you go from what you know to what that means or what you found to what that means, you want to spend a little time in what that means. Repeat it. Keep asking yourself. Um, in the hoarding case example, you know, when we were working through that story, we were talking about what did you find? Well, when they walked in, like the whole apartment was covered in feces and urine and there was trash everywhere. Um, there was just a single woman. She was the one who was involved. It was an apartment. What we knew is that she had some mental um, disabilities and, and she was ill in some ways there. So that was a piece that we knew, which brought in some attention in terms of emotion because a lot of uh, the people who donated wondered like does she even realize what she's doing wrong so that was why that was an important piece to to share but what does that mean like what does all of that mean that's what you want to ask yourself and so for us what that mean is that the it was actually cats too a lot of cats um it meant that they hadn't gotten any medical attention that we weren't sure if they really had food because they couldn't find much. They weren't sure if they were all dehydrated. They weren't sure if they were there were fleas, you know, in what we have. So all of the all of the pieces of what they walked into and found led to a lot of questions for them. And that's what that meant. And we needed to get answers. So we need to create a story that said, this is what all of what we found means. And we dove real deep into it to get those specifics because that's what light leads to the next thing, 
what you need. Obviously, what you need is is money, and that's mostly what you're asking for. You, you're trying to raise funds. So if you're partnering with your local cat cafe and you're running a fundraiser there, and you know your story that you're building there is more about your organization, then all the what that means are about the things that you can provide when you get money. And that's when you get to what you need being money because of all the things it means. So that's how it ties together, right? These things become, you, you wanna think of them separately so that when you write it together, it becomes fluid. So what you need, of course, is money, but that money provides things. And it doesn't just provide um, like actual products that you purchase and support for the animals, but it provides benefits to the animal, right? And that's where why you need it comes in. So why you need something fits in with what you need, but it's a little bit more emotionally driven right because it talks about where you hope to end now it's not the end yet because it's still a fundraiser and you don't know the end just yet of course that's the tbc um but that's why so when you're thinking about like where does the emotion fit in and the relation fit in why you need it should be um factual you want to state facts but that's a big part where you can include the emotion of what it's going to do for the pets that you serve for for and honestly when you serve pets as we know you also help people so both of those things can come into play especially when it's something like um, a tnr fundraiser for a community cats um, a colony of community cats that helps the pets but also helps the people living around them right and so that becomes a big piece of why the fundraising story spine is meant to help you piece together the details so that you can create a story that flows. It's not necessarily going to be in this order. It's not meant to be a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's meant to be details shared in a way that brings somebody from understanding what has happened to what is needed. And that's where you share who's involved, what you know, maybe what you found, what that means, and what that means. And what that means, what you need, and why you need it. That's the storytelling spine. I actually have a worksheet that just has these boxes in it so that you can work on them. So I have a, a link at the end if you would like that worksheet. I, I'm happy to. Um, actually, we'll automatically download for you, I believe, if you go to the link. So that's all fine and great, right? But you get all these details down, there's still the act of how do you put it together? That's where you need to work on just creating, um, flowing, what's important, how to do it. Oftentimes I find that if you can put these things down and then read it out loud, you will naturally fill in gaps. So one of the exercises I give to the people that I work with a lot is read it out loud and record yourself because you'll say things that you that just come to mind in the moment that are great and you'll forget if you don't have it recorded uh, so that's a great exercise to do is put all this stuff down and then start reading about it and adding in what comes to your mind because then it turns into more of a storytelling format but before we get too far what about images because that is a piece of storytelling we did talk about that right what about images i just love this image so as you're looking at your story and you're thinking about how do I show it in a visual sense, these are some tips to think about with your images. First, show the truth with caution. Um, always show the truth. However, if you have a case or a fundraiser that has some sort of graphic type images, I'm not saying don't include them. They have a place. Um, they can create a little bit of burnout faster. I do think you should choose to not lead with them, meaning the overall, the first few images people see should provide hope, which is that last note there. Hope is really, really important. So I always say show the truth, but with caution. Choose what you're leading with. Um, don't just throw pictures up. Eye contact is also really important, if whether it's people in the photos or pets, being able to see their eyes. So. In this uh, image I have here, we can 
we aren't seeing the cat's true eyes, like it's not the actual eyeball that we're looking at, so we're not making eye-to-eye -eye contact, but we can see what the cat is looking at. And we can see that it provides an emotion, right? There's this like, you know, blissness to, blissfulness to the cat's face. And that's really important that we can see some sort of eye contact. So you won't always have an image that does that and you have to work with what you have. But if you do, those are things to look at. Which ones are sort of showing hope the best? Which ones have eye contact and leading with the images that can do that? because the same thing applies. The third one, their emotion, is part of that too. If you've got some eye contacts and truths and things, it pr provokes emotion. Um, and images with emotion are always going to capture attention and give you a moment, meaning people might actually read if they're so captured by the image. When I say less is more, um, I have just seen a lot of fundraisers include so many images uh, that it starts to feel overwhelming and some of them start to feel duplicative. So definitely represent everything that you need to, uh, but don't over represent. Just give us what we need. Uh, less is more in that case. And the last one, which I mentioned already, hope is important. Hope is really, really important. People feeling like there is hope for whatever dollar they gave you to achieve the thing is really important. So don't underestimate providing hope. Okay. Let me give you some quick tips on this. When you're creating your stories, use short sentences. Um, people, especially how we're reading now, a fundraiser isn't a book. Books have the uh, sort of ability and, and are able to, because they're so, have so much content in them, to be very flexible with short sentences and long sentences and all of this. A fundraiser is meant to be read and you're gonna get a lot of people who skim so use short sentences and use short paragraphs. It's easier for them to digest that way. One note while you're, while you're creating those, don't create an edit at the same time. That's sort of like driving a car with the gas and the brake at the same time on. Your creative mind needs to be able to flow. Your editing mind needs to be able to analyze. Those things don't work well together at the same time. So create and then go back and edit. So if you are somebody who uses long sentences, don't try to make them short. Just create, write out what you need to, get it all out, and then look and be like, how can I make this very long sentences, two sentences instead? Um, do that afterwards. Once you've gotten it written, read it aloud. You'll catch a lot, you'll hear a lot when you read it aloud. It just helps. Um, it, because when you read it, you're actually processing it more like the people who will read it for the first time. If you're very close to it. So you've written it, you've written it, and you've written it. Read it aloud and that helps. And then ask someone else to read it. I like to say, ask them to read it once and then ask them what they remember from it. Because if they don't remember the thing you want them to, the thing that the story is actually about, then you might need to go back and edit the details so that they actually get them to remember what you want them to remember. Once that happens, edit the flow if you need it, right? And then read it aloud again. And finally, please do not forget the updates, the closure, that piece that lets people say, okay, I now trust fully where I've given my money and I wanna follow this organization and be a part of it. That's what those updates and closures provide. So don't underestimate them. And lastly, let's stay connected. I want everyone here who is listening to feel like they can take away a nugget of improving whatever they've done in the past, whether that's working on your headlines, whether that's getting the worksheet on my fundraising story spine and starting to think through, are these the pieces that I have told before or how can I use them going forward? There is something in here for everyone in fundraising and fundraising I said it at the beginning, but I really honor all of you in fundraising <laughs> because it's, it is it is work. It's a lot of work um, and it's heart, heart pulling work. So thank you for listening. I hope you can take the story spine and do something with your stories. You can improve them in some way. I do hope to stay connected. You can follow Blog Pause in all of these places. Um, this newsletter link, First of all, it's case sensitive, so um, I'll try to get it in the chat too when we move to Q&A here in just a second. But 
if you want to join our newsletter, I'd love that. We share lots of industry news, a lot of tips for digital marketing and online content. And if you sign up, I ha you'll get that worksheet right away. It's part of the download in that process. Okay. Really appreciate all of your time and let's move into Q&A. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chloe. That was great. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. I am not the writer person, so I will acknowledge that. Um, and uh, really interesting thought process that goes behind all that planning with it. Um, I do have a couple of comments and questions in the background here for you. Um, so I know you were asking for some um, some of the uh, like sort of the themes and some of the things that folks were working on um, or some of their ideas for for um, stories. So there's a couple of things here. One was like a person was saying they're planning to use 45 years of save uh, for their anniversary, 45th anniversary year of their organization. I missed that for 45 years of what? Uh, called 45 Years of Save, S-A-V-E, um, you know, it, it's for their last newsletter of their 45th anniversary year. Okay. I apologize, but I'm not following what the question is. <laughs> or what the... Yeah, no, no problem. No, um, earlier in the presentation, you were asking for some suggestions, some ah. ideas that people were working on. And I just thought I would share that was one idea. And another idea was mission possible. Ooh, yes. Um, I love both of those things as quippy, catchy, leading things. Uh, the 45 years of save, I'm assuming that's organization specific. Uh, can I actually turn on my webcam? I you certainly look. may. You're most welcome to. We actually just, someone just suggested that. Yep, yeah. there you are. There we go. Ah, hi. <laughs> okay. Um, so 45 years of save, that sounds very organization specific. So your current, and if it's for your like email that you're sending out to them, it sounds like your current people will know exactly what that means. Um, I might find a way to add what I'll call a tagline, even though that's not what it is, onto it that describes a little bit more of like, what does 45 year of saves mean? Because for me, you say that and I'm like, sounds interesting, I'm intrigued, but I also have no idea what you're talking about. Um, so it kind of depends on who the audience is. If this is going to an audience who knows you, it probably means something and is great. If it's going to a brand new audience, you might wanna get something in there that helps people understand what you're talking about. Great, excellent, very cool. Um, uh, Folks are asking, can you share the story, the hoarding situation story that you wrote, like a PDF or something that we can put in with our handouts? Um, I think so. Let me just circle back with that particular organization and make sure they don't care that I'm using it. It's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to put it, put it okay. out. I think they'll be fine with it. So I will say, hopefully, yes. Um, and if not, I'll see if I can just find some sort of example story that I can share. Let me actually make a note on this because if I don't write it down, it won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem. All right. Okay. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay. Super. Um, in one of our presentations earlier today with Justin, he talked a lot about um, batch working and, and that kind of thing. And, and I know I've done some of the sessions that you put on with blog posts and stuff. And I know we were focusing on storytelling today, but I mean, how do we work efficiently and effectively? Batch work, are you a rec recommender of that? Yeah, I definitely am, especially kind of what I hinted at the end related to you should batch. For me, when it comes to storytelling, there's sort of three pieces. There's one just like the brain dump, which is more like the who's involved and what do we know and just the details. Then there's the actual story creation, which is creation mind. Um, and the, one of the things that's, it is so hard for us to do in general. Every, like I struggle with it too, even though I know what I'm supposed to do, which is just let yourself create, stop backspacing if you're on your computer, stop editing as you go. Um, just, it, it's like a, a bigger brain dump. So the first brain dump is the details. The next brain dump is like really trying to flow it together. What do all those things mean if I string it together in more of a, a storytelling way, even if it's not quite edited to be the final story? We, we have come into 
a place in the world where we feel like we are always creating our final drafts. And so we're writing in that way. And that is never going to be helpful to you. You're going to stunt yourself. You're going to get blocked. You're going to be frustrated. So allow yourself the time blocking of, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to just spend these next 30 minutes getting out the details. And then maybe the next day, I mean, this depends on how much time you have and how much you can allocate. Now I'm going to look at those details and I'm actually going to write out all the specifics. I'm going to give it everything it needs. I'm not going to worry about whether I'm saying too much or my sentences are too long or any of that. I'm just going to create. And then that last blocking day is to look at that creation. And now you can start editing. Now you can be like, what does this mean? I don't even know. Get rid of that. Um, you can be looking at how long your sentences are and say, okay, I, that's a way run on sentence. Uh, I will confess. I, I tend to write as I speak. And since we don't speak in paragraphs or in sentences, unless you're talking to Siri, <laughs> you don't say exclamation point or period or comma. So I tend to have a lot of run in sentences when I write and I've just learned to like let that go and then go back and, and do the editing later because that flow that you'll get into when you're in creation is really important. When you can get yourself in that flow, you don't wanna stunt it. So when it comes to time blocking, I like to think of storytelling in those three buckets. What about our attention span? Uh, you know, we, we thought, oh, holiday appeal letter, we need to write a year end letter, um, you know, is four pages, two pages, people mm -hmm. only read the first two sentences. I mean, I, I feel like, well, if only if people are only going to read the first two sentences, why do we need to do like the whole four page thing? or the two page thing with the highlights and the bullets. So, you know, what are your tips and tricks with regards to the, the year end stories? Yes, I love that question because um, year end, so kind of going back to what it's about, right? If you're doing a year end story, it is about the year. So you are gonna have highlights and, and maybe struggles, whatever you wanna put in there. I would format it more like you would format a, a newsletter or even a blog post with those headings, bullet points. A key to me in a year end type letter is contrast in what people look at. And what I mean when I say contrast is it's not just paragraph after paragraph after paragraph after paragraph, because that is going to get a, oh gosh, that's a lot to look at, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's just what people do. That is That goes back to the, you're not going to capture their attention when it's written like that. Um, a lot of people send their year end newsletters now via email. And so you want to think about somebody looking at it on here, because that's the well, my pets. That's what's going to happen is they're going to look at it. A lot of them, if it's coming via email, we get our emails on our phone. Even if we don't do a lot of other things on our phone, a lot of us get our emails on our phone. And so think about structuring it in a way similar to what I gave in the storytelling. Actually, you want some headlines. You want several headlines. You want the headline of each section that it's about. Don't worry about having too many because if the only thing somebody does is skims the headlines, they will stop at the one that talks to them, that speaks to them, that they want to connect with. And that might be enough. I think one of one of the things we have to sort of remember when we're sharing things like a year-end story is that not everything we did matters to every donor. And that's okay. So if you can break it out in the ways of this is for the donor who just can only donate $5 once in a while and they actually care about all these small campaigns. This is for the big donor who makes some huge donation every year and wants to know that the organization is continuing to progress. This is for the donor, you know, think of it in that way. You're, the year in letter, as much as it's about the organization, it's for the donor. It's for the story the donor can tell. It's for the pieces that they connect with. So if you can break it out in those ways and know exactly which donor each of those headings is for and break the content up so that donor can find the thing that speaks to them easily, you're going to have a bigger open rate. You're going to have probably more responses um, and it will be a more successful year end letter. In your opinion, what is a good open rate? So open rates in nonprofit probably range in the 25 to 30%. I would say you should be striving for 40 to 50. Um, the organization that I was on the board with, that was one of our goals was driving up our open rate. And we pulled it from about 30 to the high 30s. We're still, we, well, I'm not on it anymore. I know they're still trying to, to pull it up. And that's the headline piece, right? Um, and now, so kind of back to the, um, 45 years of saves or the mission impossible, I think it or mission, I forget what the other one was. 
if that's a headline, so that's the subject of your email, you now get the preview text. And, and I don't know of any email software that doesn't allow the preview text. So if, if, every, if everyone knows, hopefully they know what I mean. If not, I'm going to show you right now on my phone. When I go in, oh, look, when I go into my email here, I don't know if you can see it. Um, I'll do this. So this top email up here from you, Stacey, about the reminder. So the bold is the headline. The preview text is what's underneath. We can all see that now on our phones. So make use of both. If that headline is, you know, uh, 45 years of saves, that preview text should give me more information. You have, and people will, when you're scrolling your email, you tend to look at both of those things. So those are the pieces that will get them to open it. And those are the important pieces for that capture. You're capturing their attention. And then to hold it, design your email so they can find the piece that relates to them. And in terms of your email list that you have, um, how do we I don't know, keep it clean, keep it active? I mean, do we purge the names that we haven't had activity with in a while? So I like two things when it comes to your email list and who's active and who isn't. One is most email softwares have a way to segment active users and let you define what that means. So I know like MailerLite does it, MailChimp does it, ConvertKit does it, um, the uh, Send in Blue, I'm trying to think of all. So whatever you're using, there probably is a way to go in there and say, I, every three months, I want it to automatically tell me and put in a list who's been opening my emails over the last three months. And, I, and for active emails, I would say go at least three months, sometimes even six, depending on how often you're emailing, because you'd be surprised how often one of your donors opens one email every few months and that's it. But they're still active. They still care if they're opening something. So don't make it like, oh, if they didn't open the last one, they're not active anymore or anything right. like that. But you should be able to segment that so that you can kind of keep track of who's active and who isn't. And from there, what you can do with that data is maybe once a year, you can have what I like to call a, is this a goodbye campaign? And you can send something that literally says that in the headline, is this goodbye? And it's a way to say to them, we see you haven't been active. Maybe you do care and you're just, you know, haven't opened emails or maybe you don't. If you want to stay involved, click here. Or, you know, if you if you want to not be involved, please unsubscribe. We're, that's fine. We, you know, we as organizations, all organizations everywhere should be more accepting of the people who are our people wanting to be involved and the people who aren't opting out. It's, it's more helpful for us to have engaged lists than it is to have large lists. Um, so those are the two things I would do. Find a way to segment and then use that segmentation to say, hey, you know, and you only have to do that like once a year. Right. Stay involved yeah. or not um, and, and just keep kind of keeping it fresh. Yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. I love it. I love it. I think we'll make sure we, we're doing it at the organizations that I'm involved with for sure, for sure. Well, Chloe, I want to thank you. This was incredible uh, information. Fantastic. Um, yeah appreciate it and um i'll pass along any questions from the group but i think we've got most of them covered again Perfect. thank you so much and i think you are bouncing back and forth with the cat writers association conference yeah. this weekend right <laughs> so just to share with folks a little bit about what the cat writers association is uh yeah so i'm a professional member of the cat writers association and they're a it's basically an association, so a membership of people who cover cats, and that is through online content, that's through even photography, video, books, short stories, publications, um, anyone who writes any kind of content and that is in all types, entertainment, health, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it is, it's about cats, it's focused on cats, and they have a membership where you can connect with other cat writers. Um, there's a lot of collaboration and networking that goes in there. They also have an annual conference where they bring in people to talk about lots of different things, publication, social media, branding. Um, but if you are somebody who writes about cats and likes cats, check out the Cat Writers Association because, yes, that event is going on this weekend and actually their awards are tonight as well. And um, Community Cats Podcast has gotten a couple of awards from yes. them and it's uh, we're very excited and proud to be part of the Cat Writers Association. So that's that's you're great. a finalist, right? Something you, I, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I think you are you are a finalist for like amusement alien or something. I saw them post that and I thought, oh Stacy. Uh, yep. so congrats on that for you too. But yes, that is going on. And I'm you know, blog pause, please. We have a free community that um, you know, you'll get 
if you join our newsletter in the link that I know was shared, you'll get the download for the PDF to help you do the stories and, and be on our newsletter, which will invite you to our Facebook community. And we share a lot of, we're very focused on digital, like all this stuff we were just talking about at the end here, email marketing, everything. We do a lot of that and, and a lot of teaching for pet, pet businesses and organizations specifically trying to grow online. Excellent. Chloe, thank you so much. Yeah. That's great. Thank you for having me.